The craziest and most dangerous criminals on Earth are sent to conquer another world. Harley asks Joker if he's ever thought of entering a new world where things were entirely different and they could have everything they always wanted. One of their captives removes his gag and he begs Harley to spare his life because he would do anything to be set free. Harley walks over to him and she puts the anesthetic gag over his mouth, which renders him unconscious. Joker calls her over and she walks over to him, promising to take him to the new world where they don't have to worry about anything ever again. Meanwhile, some scientists are checking on a program and decide to prioritize power without paying attention to minor leaks. They inform the program director that everything is ready and she approves the program's initiations. They power up the machine as the director observes from the observation deck above the program test areas. Police break into the building holding the hostages, but as they try to help them an explosive detonates, blowing the entire floor off the building. This causes traffic accidents on the road below as Joker and Harley drive off in their getaway car, which Joker pilots by playing a piano. Harley is impressed with the destruction they were able to cause, but Joker tells her that it's just a prelude to his grand plan. The police chase them down while several police cars form a blockade in front of them. Joker cues Harley to fire a missile launcher that takes out the cars ahead of them. He tells her that he's intrigued by the idea of a new world because it's what he's been itching for. He cuts open the bags of money in the vehicle and dollar bills fill the air, falling like rain as they continue to drive back to their lair. He is disappointed that the world is so ugly to behold so he decides to change that as people on the streets rush to pick up the bills falling from heaven like manna. The machine can't fully form the portal and the director wonders what is wrong with the machine. The scientists inform her that the power input isn't enough to power the machine and she tells them to increase the power. The scientist tells her that the girl will be strained past what she can handle but the director tells them the girl is just a tool to open the gate. She tells them to increase the power of the machine and the scientists have no choice but to follow her orders. Joker tells Harley that everyone else is also tired of the present world and they wish they could destroy everything and get into a new world. The police were still trying to chase them down, but Harley knocked several explosives at the cop cars chasing them, taking them out of the chase. The specimen struggles against her bonds as she's overloaded to power the portal machine. The gate begins to form as the director watches on. Joker tells Harley that people's souls are screaming out to them because they feel like they're in a foreign land but the people are too timid to take action. Harley is disappointed that people are so weak, but Joker tells her they would change the narrative by using everything at their disposition to make a change. Harley suddenly pulls on the brakes and she tells them they need to get a drink for the road so they'll be in the right state of mind to change the world. She walks towards the bar to order some drinks and Joker can't help but compliment her as the best woman in the world. Harley walks into the bar and she throws money into the air, wondering if everyone is having a good time, all she gets is some cricket sounds and she suddenly becomes suspicious. She looks around to see several people with long faces and she wonders if she walked into a funeral home by accident. She approaches the bartender at the counter who welcomes her, she orders something sweet and she asks after KJ the usual bartender. The new bartender tells her he called in sick, but she informs him that he's been tricked because there's nobody in the bar named KJ. Before the bartender could react and take her down, she knocks him out with a bottle, his other henchmen in the bar get to their feet and rush at Harley who warns Joker not to step into the bar. The Joker realizes that something is wrong after Harley shouts out this warning. The scientists advise the director to call off the program but she tells them to keep going, the gate begins to overload and it gets violent, destroying some parts of the test area. A glass in the observation area breaks and a portion embeds itself in the ceiling above the scientist, which makes them scared but the director tells them not to stop the operation. Harley fights off the henchmen in the bar, but she's pinned down behind a table by some henchmen who are shooting at her. Some other henchmen outside shoot at the Joker, but he uses the car to take them out and he crashes into the bar, distracting the shooting henchmen. Harley uses this opportunity to take down the henchmen in the bar. Joker drives away from the bar, swerving as he dodges the tank shots from military vehicles which are trying to chase him down. Harley climbs up to the roof of the bar and she contacts Joker trying to get his location. A samurai steps into the scene and throws a dagger at her but she dodges it at the last minute. She looks up at the samurai, who jumps down from the roof of a higher building and lands gracefully like a cat. The samurai unsheathed her sword and she takes her battle stance. Harley wonders why a samurai is bothered about someone as insignificant as her, but she takes out her baseball bat and they begin to battle. Harley can hold her own against the samurai for a while but the samurai knocks the bat with her hands and pins her down with her sword. Harley escapes from the sticky situation, using her wits and she breaks off a pipe to use as her new weapon, she continues battling the samurai who disarms her once again and knocks her down. 
The samurai becomes relaxed after realizing she has defeated Harley. Harley tries to get back to her feet and engage the samurai in some conversation but the samurai knocks her out cold. The portal is still overloading, but it suddenly stabilizes with a huge explosion, which produces a huge smile on the director's face. The samurai hands over Harley to the police authorities, who apologize to her for letting the Joker slip away. The explosion knocks out the scientists, but the director is happy to announce the beginning of a new world because they opened the portal. The warden tries to dissuade the director from interacting with the supervillains because they're dangerous, but she tells him she already has approval to do what she wants. She tells the warden to do what she asked him to because he's already under scrutiny for mismanaging assets. He opens the door to Harley's cells, where she's watching a movie and eating some pizza, she's interrupted by the director and she protests but she immediately goes quiet when the military men took her at gunpoint. The director tells her she's going to do a job for her but Harley is reluctant to obey her because she's not her parents, the military men threaten her with their guns and Harley realizes that she doesn't have a choice in the matter so she gives in and the military men handcuffed her. The warden tries to get a thank you out of her for giving her favorable treatment but she greets his future generation with her legs, telling him that only the Joker has free reign over her. The director teases her and she tells the men to take her away, while she tells the warden to take her to the next supervillain cell. The warden tells her that no one in their right mind could free the supervillains and the director agrees with him, telling him people have to embrace insanity so they can taste the new world. Harley regains consciousness, shackled in a confined space in a helicopter where she sees another inmate sitting beside her. The guy is disappointed that she's a psycho but another inmate tells him to treat Harley like a gentleman. The gentleman prisoner tries to prove that he's not a common inmate but Harley and the other male inmate can't notice anything different about him. They get into an argument and the gentleman inmate tells them to drop the issue, Harley notices another inmate who looks like a Jason rip-off sitting next to the gentleman. She wonders if he had a shaving mistake, which prompted him to hide his face, but he tells her he's hiding his face because it would hinder their mission if people behold his face. The male inmate asks him if he knows about the mission they're hauling them out for and he tells them that they must be on a mission of peace because that's the only thing he strives for. The male inmate realizes that the peace inmate is also crazy because they can't be a team put together to promote peace, an agent walks into their confines and he's glad to see they're conscious. The gentleman asks him to free them of their bonds since they'll take time to get to their destination but he tells them that they've already arrived. He informs them that they're on a mission of peace and he asks them to listen to their instructions from the director. The director appears on the screen and the inmates are surprised to see her, she tells them they're to work with Adam the agent to conduct a mission which will lead to a reduced sentence if they're successful. She tells them their mission is to secure some bridgeheads, which are vital frameworks for conducting research and providing resources to a certain region. The male inmate tells her he doesn't understand her explanation but wonders why she thinks they'll be compliant. She informs them that they have bombs planted into her head and she can help relieve the weight of their heads off their shoulders anytime she wishes. She tells them the bomb also has a timer that makes it detonate if they go outside the radius of their servers so escape is impossible. The male inmate still doesn't want to be compliant and the director tells him she knows about his daughter. This riles up the inmates and he threatens to hurt Amanda if she touches his daughter, she tells them to follow Adam's instructions since there are no more objections and the screen goes blank. Adam tells them to change into their gear, which is in a crate and get prepared for the mission, he's about to release Harley from her cuff when the gentleman inmate points out that one of the inmates is missing because Amanda said there are five of them, but only four were in the confined room. The emergency light suddenly goes off and Adam rushes to the cockpit where he sees the pilots unconscious, the helicopter loses control and crashes. A medieval knight whose army is fighting off some trolls notices the helicopter and decides to investigate it. Harley takes off her cuffs and she walks outside to see that Adam and the pilots are unconscious, she tries to step off the helicopter, but the male inmate catches her before she falls off the cliff. He pulls her back into the chopper as the other inmates free themselves and the gentleman transforms his hands and breaks off another door where they can get out. The inmates are surprised to find out that he's a metahuman, they step out and they realize they're in a different world. They think they're on a movie set and they're impressed with how realistic everything looks. They're still trying to understand where they are when they're suddenly surrounded by brutes who just took down a soldier. The gentleman tries to explain that they're foreigners and he asks the brutes to take them to their producer, but one of the brutes attacks him. He dodges the attack, but the remains from the shoulder splashes on Harley's face which makes her realize that it's real. The male inmate notices this too, and Harley is happy that she can hurt the brutes because they were able to figure out that they're not on their side. 
the shark inmate suddenly emerges from the helicopter and proceeds to eat pork heads in record time. Harley also gets into a frenzy and she takes down a lot of the brutes. The masked inmate turns out to be Peacemaker who takes down the brute so they don't hinder his mission to achieve peace. The metahuman Clayface transforms into a clay monster and he takes down several brutes. The male inmate Deadshot gears up and takes down the brutes with his gadgets but he decides to look out for the brute commander because the brutes aren't backing down. He identifies the boss and tries to take him down from afar but a brute steps in his way and he decides to get to high ground and take down the boss, the brutes run off after their boss is taken down. The knight arrives but he's on edge and draws his sword because the shark is devouring a pigling but Deadshot knocks his sword out of his hands, assuring him that they're good guys. The knight recalls his sword with clay face walks up to him and tries to convince him that they're good guys. He realizes they're now in an Esekai word but Deadshot tells him their mission is pointless. While Deadshot and Peacemaker are quarreling, Clayface tries to convince the knight take them to their king because their chosen warriors anointed to end the war, this statement lands them in jail. Meanwhile, an oracle informs a group of people that strangers from another world have arrived in their kingdom. The story continues, we see the queen rides through the kingdom on a chariot and the people try to reach out to her, but her guards push them away from the roads. The people of parliament watch as the people beg desperately for help as the queen moves through the village and they mock them for their desperation. The people of the cabinet commend the queen's efforts in rallying their troops and ensuring they win the war when a knight of the cabinet doesn't think it's a cause of celebration because of the impact it had on the people. The cabinet members argue that the people's condition was inevitable because they had to direct their resources to their frontline soldiers, they wonder if the knight has something against celebrating the glory of their queen. The knight tries to make them see reason, but the queen suddenly steps into the room cutting him off, she tells them she doesn't consider their battle a victory until the last brutes are crushed before the kingdom can experience true peace. The cabinet members immediately agree with her, retracting their earlier statements. The knight asks for the queen's opinion about the strangers who arrived in their kingdom from a different world. The queen was aware of their contribution to the battle which turned the tide in their favor. The knight informs her that the strangers are locked up in the great prison because they aren't sure of their mission. The queen tells them to let the strangers me, because she has more pressing matters. The knight suggests that the queen releases the stranger because their weapons could be put to good use, but the queen dismisses his suggestion as the words of the coward. She was disappointed in him, wondering where the hero who once saved the kingdom and was blessed with the sacred armor by the princess had gone. She orders them to draft war plans by the next day and dismisses the meeting. Fiani calls the attention of the queen, who is her mother because she wants to talk about how they can utilize the strangers that Cecil the Knight had mentioned but the queen cuts her off. She asks Fiani if she has valuable information about them that she would like to share with but Fiani tells her that she doesn't. The queen tells her to keep her mouth and she walks away from the cabinet meeting. Fiani retreats to her bedroom, where she watches over the village with her magic spyglass, she zooms in on some children fighting over a piece of bread which makes her pity them. She looks over at her table, where her lunch is sitting waiting for her and though she wasn't hungry, she couldn't bring herself to eat it. She suddenly hears a knock on her door and tells her visitor to come in, Cecil the knight walks in and he tells her he has come in answer to her summons. He notices she hasn't touched her lunch and advises her to eat because she's only depriving herself of food that won't get to the people she's worried about. Fiony tells him that she doesn't have an appetite for food but makes him for a favor. Harley is in an interrogation room where an officer reads her case file, she once worked as a psychiatrist at Arkham Asylum before she fell in love with the Joker, who was imprisoned there and she helped him escape. They've been partners in crime since then, but one of the officers remarks how dumb she was despite being a doctor. They mock her for thinking she was the heroine in a romantic movie, but she asks them if they failed the officer's exam which draws their attention. She mocks them for turning out as prison guards because they couldn't cut it as policemen, they get enraged by this and knock over the table. They begin using a taser on Harley and she's about to pass out but they tell her to remain conscious because they're about to teach her a lesson. Suddenly they explode into dust as Joker steps into the scene and extend his hand to Harley. Harley gladly reaches out to take his hand but all she feels is air, she wakes up on the cold floor of her cell and she suddenly sits up. She expresses how disappointed she is in reality and the others notes that she's awake. Deadshot asks if anyone knows what's going on and Clayface tells him they must be unwanted guests, since no one has come to pick them up yet. Deadshot already figured that out since they're stuck behind bars and he yells this out to Clayface. Clayface tells him there's no use shouting because they share the same frustration but he points out that they should be treated better since they helped the kingdom win the war against brutes. 
Clayface was initially hyped about being in an Esekai, but he's now disappointed that the god of the Esekai world doesn't understand how an Esekai works. He decides to change the rules if he has a chance which makes Deadshot realize that he's a third-rate movie star who always forces the script change. While Clayface isn't happy with Deadshot's impression of him, Peacemaker reminds them to be wary of time because they've been stuck in the new world for 12 hours. He reminds them that they have just 60 hours to live before their heads explode and he advises them to return to the helicopter before that time elapses. While Deadshot is surprised the Peacemaker has a brain, Harley is curious why Peacemaker prioritizes the bomb instead of Amanda's mission. He tells her he serves liberty and he's doing a Mando's mission simply because it would lead to peace. Clayface decides to break them out of prison because he doesn't want them to remain stuck there, but Deadshot tells him it's pointless because the shark's brute force wasn't enough to break open the bars. Clayface tells him he's not planning to use brute force and he transforms himself into clay and walks through the bars easily. He tells them to hang tight while he gets things in motion but he tells them their survival isn't guaranteed, they are pissed off by this and they decide to rat him out to the guards before he's able to escape. The guards come running and Clayface tries to run away but Peacemaker holds him against the bars because he knows he would be vital to their mission. Clayface transforms into the clay monster and he's about to break free but the guard puts a magic cuffs in his hands which subdues his powers and changes him back into his human form. He tries to transform again without success and the guards tackle him to the ground. The others mock him for now being powerless and he wonders why the side characters are trying to hinder the development of the MC. The guard opens the cell door and he tells the others to step out. They go out for lunch the prison cafeteria but they aren't impressed with the food that was served. Deadshot asks Clayface if he'll include them in his next escapade but he tells them that he doesn't plan to escape anymore because he hasn't been able to use his powers since he was put in handcuffs. Some ogres suddenly walk up to them and he tells Clayface that he's in his seat, he asks him to get up so he doesn't infect seat with human weakness. Deadshot gets out of his seat understanding what to do to the prison bullies but Clayface advises him against it because it would only increase their sentence at the prison. Deadshot tells him there's no way around it because he can't get along with such a different species. Clayface convinces him to calm down because they can reason with the ogres, but he isn't pleased that they had to leave the shark behind because they couldn't get him to wake up. The ogre tells him again that he's in his seat and Clayface stands up, apologizing and explaining that they're new to the prison so they didn't know. The ogre dismisses Clayface, but he decides to pay his respect to the ogre after figuring out that he's the prison boss, with the way the other prisoners look at him. The ogre thinks Clayface is making fun of him and he hits him with a right hook, before he can finish his sentence, Clayface is sent flying by the punch's force as the ogres share a good laugh at his expense. Harley empties her bowl of soup and she tosses the empty bowl as the boss is ogre, which makes him mad. Deadshot immediately flips the table as he lashes out, but the ogre punches through the table easily, he ends the punch at Harley but Peacemaker steps in to stop his punch and Harley girls our empty bowl at his face, which makes him lose balance. Harley takes him down and follows up with several hits with her bowl, which renders the ogre completely motionless. Peacemaker takes care of the other two ogres acting as the boss's bodyguards. Harley celebrates her victory, but the boss suddenly grabs her by the neck. Deadshot comes to her aid by breaking a chair on the ogre's back, which makes him release Harley, who knocks him out. The prison guard walked in the squad celebrating their win and he orders for the wands to be brought. The other prisoner takes to their heels at the mention of the wand and the squad wonders what is going on. Two more guards arrive at the scene with the wands and they use them to render the immobile. The chief guard orders that all the perpetrators be thrown into the disciplinary cell. They're taken to a new cell and Harley wonders what kind of attack they used on them. Deadshot tells her it must have been magic, remembering what Clayface said to them when they landed. Deadshot taps Clayface who regains consciousness while Peacemaker tries to pull open the bars without success. Someone suddenly asks them for their identity, wondering if they came from another world. Harley tells him to introduce himself first and he tells them he's Rick Flagg, an agent who works for Argus, the research facility where they were kept prisoner. Harley figures out that Rick used to work with Amanda and Rick figures out that she's Harley Quinn, Joker's partner. Deadshot is surprised to find out that she's Harley, while Rick calls out the names of the rest of the squad. They are surprised that he knows their names and Deadshot asks him what he wants with them. Rick asks them when they got to the New World and Deadshot tells him they got there the previous day after they were fed a bunch of lies. Rick is surprised that Amanda decided to get serious with the program, with how lost the squad looks, he figures out they weren't filled in on the details. He tells them they aren't the first group Amanda sent to that world. He informs them he left the first mission to make contact with that world through the gate, which was some months earlier. 
He tells them they were charged with finding water and food resources which they could monopolize for the benefit of their country. Deadshot realizes they sent them there as criminals to clean up their mess because no one values their lives. Rick asks them who was in charge of their mission and Harley tells him it was Adam, who was squashed by the helicopter. He asks them about the bombs on their next peacemaker tells him they still have about 58 hours on the timer. Rick doesn't understand what he means, and Deadshot explains that the bombs receive radio waves that stop them from going off. Rick decides to help them escape and get back to the entry point into the world because the radio waves would be coming from there. They don't trust Rick, but sharks suddenly wake up hungry and he smells them as his next meal. He's about to eat them when Rick calls him by his real name and points him towards the gate telling him food is on the other side, this prompts the shark to use his strength to break through the gate. A guard is about to use the wand to take him down but Deadshot uses a rock to destabilize him and Harley takes him down with the wand. Clayface takes the key to his magic cuffs from the guard and he frees himself, he then releases the other inmates from their cells and they all run for the exit. More guards try to suppress them with the magic of the wand but they break free and take down the guards. They all make a run for the exit, taking down guards along the way while working together with the other inmates. They make a mess of the prison as they find their way to freedom. Cecil is on a carriage as he recalls how Princess Fione begged him to talk to Harley since they were powerful enough to change the tide of the battle. Cecil reminds her that they know nothing about them, but she begs him to learn more about them because she wants to end the war as quickly as possible. The driver suddenly stops the carriage and calls out to him, showing him that the inmates have broken out of prison. The inmates are celebrating their victory when Harley notices the carriage and informs everyone that they have company. She tells them not to be bothered because they don't have enough troops to take them down, but Rick cries out telling them they are wasting time celebrating. Meanwhile, on the other side of who knows where this is, the Royal Knights are trying to show their power to the werewolves. Our criminal group is watching everything from above, while Harley Quinn tries to commentate and asks Deadshot who has the advantage. He claims that both sides are even matched, but the result is obvious since one side is trying to siege the castle. She asks him why and he explains the human side is stupid for charging head on without a plan. He thinks the beast's side has a better commander and they look like a modern special forces unit. He then asks Peacemaker how much time they still have left and he replies that they have 30 hours remaining. Deadshot thinks it's not enough time to make a proper attack plan, especially when against a good commander, we then return back to the time when Cecil returned to the castle that was taken over by the squad. Deadshot throws and pebbles to stop him from moving forward and jumps down with the remaining group. Cecil gets annoyed to see the freed orcs and asks the squad what they are doing, Clayface then notices Cecil is the guy who captured them. Harley confirms but Cecil just complains by stating that they're rebelling against the kingdom. They all start making fun of Cecil's airport hairline, making him mad and since this guy can't take a joke, he tries to use his sword to attack Harley. Unfortunately, King Shark catches it with his mouth and eats it, Cecil uses his telekinesis to bring the sword back, slicing King Shark's stomach but the power of Esekai armor prevails when King Shark heals his injury. The group is ready to fight again but Rick Flagg tries to stop them explaining he has an idea, he knows that fighting back will ruin their mission as they will be chased by the knights. He then steps forward and starts speaking Cecil's language, the inmates explain him the situation and he tells Cecil he wants him to take him to his boss because he wants to make a deal. Obviously, he took his chance to insult him with every sentence, the squad notices Cecil's reaction and ask if Rick is really able to speak the language since he learned his form the orcs. Rick thinks everything is fine but Cecil cannot take it anymore and prepares to attack him, yet he suddenly remembers the princess's words that she wanted to meet the squad and asked for help on ending the war. He suddenly calms down and tells the group to follow him, Rick thinks he's the Chad and thanks Cecil, while insulting him again without knowing. The squad is gently escorted like the illegal immigrants to the castle, inside they notice everyone's action and think they're not welcomed. In fact, Everyone is worried because King Shark doesn't look human and wonder if the squad really won the battle, Cecil then introduces the queen who shows up with her daughter. The group continue to make comments about how fat her you know looks like, but the queen uses a spell to make them understand her language and asks what they are talking about. Harley thinks she's just a genius who managed to understand the language while Clayface is still in his Esekai hype train phase. Rick steps forward and explains that he requested the audience because he wants to request something. The queen, however, asks him who is he because as she remembers, they're all her prisoners. Everyone comments on how they should know their place and how lucky they were to even be allowed inside the castle. Rick tries to negotiate, explaining that they have useful information for the kingdoms but in return, the queen must allow them to move freely. 
The queen doesn't react, but he continues, he explains that he noticed the empire has grown stronger during this war because they replaced all their senior officers. The princess is impressed, but the queen replies she isn't stupid and already knew that a long time ago, she wants to send them to jail, but Rick reveals that those empire new senior officers are actually people from another world just like them. The queen's officials are confused because that doesn't seem to be any logical, Rick continues by saying that those officers are extremely dangerous but he has some information. Unfortunately, Harley Quinn decides to open her mouth, she already got what happened and states that those same officers are the group that was sent before this squad. Rick tells her to shut up but Deadshot joins the party along with the remaining members, they all realize that Rick was ditched by the last squad and join them Empire have some great time. Yet, the Queen realizes that this is all because of Rick's fault, she orders her soldiers to get ready which was quite obvious even to the crazy Harley Quinn. Yet, Peacemaker feels the urge for his call of justice, he tells the Queen they're willing to do whatever it takes to atone for that mistake and that she should send them to any battlefield he wants. He claims that they will go there one shot everyone and bring peace once again. Obviously she's thirsty for those muscles and takes the deal. She asks Rick if they will fulfill this promise, which he confirms. She uses her magic to restrain him and tells the squad to prove it to her, otherwise Rick will become a headless chicken. Cecil doesn't want the squad to fight their battle, but the Queen reasons that he was the one who brought them here. Also, they wouldn't be in this situation if the soldiers were actually useful. Rick is escorted to the prison bathroom while the group starts making fun of him, he tells them to get the job done, but Deadshot doesn't care since he didn't create this mess. However, Rick is the only one who knows where the return gate is located and if they don't do this, they'll lose their heads. The group still doesn't care and think about how hungry they are and their desire to eat. Harley then asks the queen to return their stuff to them and they all get their stuff. After taking their time to get ready, the group prepares to leave the palace and end where we saw in the beginning. Obviously, Cecil gave them a warning to stay out of it because the useless royal forces would do the fighting. Deadshot doesn't want to hurt Cecile Pride, but Clayface wants to help because they could get a better outcome. Peacemaker feels like useless allies are dead weight and should be dead to avoid getting on their way. Deadshot agrees since it will be hard to deal with the werewolves since they're like kamikaze fighters. He wonders how they were trained, but Harley explains they were simply brainwashed. She reveals that the werewolves in the back are injured, but they're still fighting. They don't care about the pain nor about the state of the battle. Therefore, they can only be in a brainwashed status. Clayface is surprised because he knows a lot about the topic. Harley smiles and explains that she experienced it. She was a wimpy girl until she got brainwashed by Joker. Deadshot thinks about brainwashing the amount of obedient animals and the squad that came before them. He thinks he's been in a similar situation and tells the group to follow him because he knows who's the Empire's commander. Harley asks if he's a friend and Deadshot confirms, stating he's one of his homies from the Slammer, who he saved several times from harassment. Deadshot already analyzed the place and knows there must be one or two escape routes, Clayface confirms and uses his power on a wall to open a hole, Deadshot feels stupid because Clayface could use his power to take down the whole fort. Yet, Clayface replies that he isn't suitable for that task as his original power only allows him to change the shape of his body. Deadshot is confused but Clayface simply asks if he doesn't feel different, he explains that he feels like there is some kind of magical power flowing inside him. Harley thinks about the past and realizes that these way stronger in this world. Clayface then continues by stating that his new powers don't seem to have much use in the fort because the bricks don't have much moisture. Harley is confused but he simply explains that his power is to manipulate Clang. Yet, his clay power is normally used with his body but in this world he can manipulate any type of clay. Deadshot doesn't also think that's useful, but Clayface still thinks he's the main character and claims that he needs some sort of flaw, just like his line of thought. The group steps inside the fort and starts taking down every werewolf in the way, the shark is eating Harley hitting some home runs, Deadshot giving someone taps Peacemaker choking and Clayface is obviously claying with ass. After a long run, the group manages to reach the place where the enemy commander is the enemy commander is. Commander claims he never thought someone would be able to get past his guards, but Deadshot simply replies he doesn't want to fight after all, he and Rat, the enemy commander are brothers before, Rat looks back and cannot believe it. Deadshot mentions the same thing but Harley asks if this is the guy they're looking for, Deadshot introduces him as Rat Catcher one of his few homies. Yet, Rat is mad and starts insulting Deadshot turns out that back in time, Rat didn't have any friends other than, you guessed it Rats. Obviously, everyone made fun of him but rats simply thought humans were stupid because rats are way more capable. 
This noise and noise Deadshot who told them to shut up and since everyone was afraid of him, they did, Deadshot's protection story is actually comparing those two losers to Rat the third loser of the prison. He numbered all possible bad traits someone could have if they were your average YouTube viewer. Yet he still smirked while he made fun of Rat, even used to visit Rat's cell and forcefully traded smelly cheese for food. Rat wasn't even safe while taking a number two, Deadshot would be there to shave Rat's head. In short, Deadshot was a huge bully and rats couldn't go against it. Deadshot thinks everything was Gucci and they were brothers, but turns out this is a Mexican soap opera. Everyone now realizes what happened and starts dissing Deadshot. Unable to hold his emotions, Rat orders his werewolves to attack the squad. Deadshot doesn't understand what's going on because rats should only have power over, you guessing rats. Therefore, he starts free hitting every werewolf on his way, the squad is also forced to fight. You know the drill, home runs, some heavy bites and the average American. The group thinks this is too much to handle and Harley asks Deadshot to fix this whole thing, but as you guessed it, Deadshot thinks he was being a nice guy and asks Rat what's going on. Rat obviously doesn't like this and uses his power to make his werewolves stronger. Clayface is still here boys sitting on the corner, though and starts to talk about history. In short, there are water tanks on the top of some tower and Deadshot opens them up with bullets. Clayface uses this to use his new skill and basically makes a hole of clay, forcing the werewolves down. Literally, Rat is shocked but this gives peacemakers a chance to headshot him, just as the bullet is about to hit, Cartana arrives and cuts the bullet in half, she then grabs Rat and jumps down the fort. Harley isn't happy about it and calls her a, you guessed it, she's all annoyed that Katana is here but there isn't much time to think since the clay is taking the whole fort down. Cecil doesn't understand what's going on, neither do I at this point, but he knows that it was our squad. He complains because he's just like a girl but Deadshot just mocks him. Cecil is annoyed because he planned to take the fort back but they can't now because it went down. Deadshot is smart and tells them to super glue it and clean it. Cecil is completely annoyed with the queen and her boys watch everything, happy they managed to fight against the empire, the princess is happy because she knew the squad could help them. Yet, on the other side, Katana tells Rat she will only help him this time because the Emperor doesn't want failures. Rat promises he won't fail this time and he will take the squad down with his new army of dogs. That brings the episode to an end. Thanks for watching. Want next part subscribe the channel and turn on notification bell.